Well, hey guys. Thanks for clicking on that video thumbnail showing the new articulated camera boom arm and gantry that I just finished building for improved video production work here in the Next Level Carpentry Shop. It's a new year after all, and I decided to start it out with new gear to replace the simple but useful Manfrotto tripod that I've used to shoot hundreds of videos over almost 10 years. The ultimate irony is that even though the opening shots of this video are taken from the articulated arm, and you can see the gantry track on the ceiling here above my head, I still need my trusty Manfrotto tripod to show you a view of a camera on the articulated arm itself. And to add yet one more layer of irony to this introduction, I now have an old camera mounted on the new boom arm, and the new functional camera is mounted on the old tripod. But ultimately, this is what the whole setup looks like. As you might imagine, it took a while to settle on the design that I was going to build for the use in the shop, and I started off with a checklist of features and functions that were necessary to be able to use this the way I wanted to get the camera angles I wanted from the camera positions that I needed for various work that goes on in the shop. And I started making a list of check boxes by watching other videos on YouTube for articulated arms, overhead arms, camera gantries, etc. And after watching a number of those videos out there, each one with its own merits, functions, features, and ultimate overall look when it's completed, I pick and chose what I thought were the best of the features from others' ideas and generated a SketchUp model that ultimately led to the building, construction, and design of the arm that you're seeing now. And so what you see here is not a creation that's completely original to me, but it's an amalgamation of, of ideas, design concepts, and principles that I got from other videos. So I want to thank everybody else that's produced a video on a similar topic out there. And as they say, we see farther than others because we stand on their shoulders. So thanks to everybody that did those videos because that helped um, move the art forward and helped me end up with this. And because some of the original concepts, I didn't come up with those myself, I was able to apply my energies to refining the design itself for the overall look because that was one of the boxes at the top of my list that I had to check off. I didn't want it to look dysfunctional and clunky. I wanted it to be elegant and functional. And I'm pleased with the result even though I'd have to say if I started over again today, I might actually come up with a different design altogether. And I'm saying all that to say this, that this build video will be a little different than other ones here on Next Level Carpentry, because when I started making this, I really had no idea if it was going to be worth the effort. Uh, I shot video as I went along building this, and ultimately it turned out it worked great. So I'm basically going to twice bake that content as I go through the um, an overview of the build process here. And I'll attempt to show you key things that were involved in this build, although I'm just going to be making parts that look like these in the current video production. And I'll weave together with video I took when I was actually making this arm. And so if there's any confusion in the process, just leave a question or a comment below and I'll try to straighten it out if it doesn't come out clear in the video itself. And with all that said, let me give you a quick overview of the features and functions of this arm, and then I'll get into the process of actually building one like this. And my goal there is to give you an overview of the process because I think you'll see uh, as the video goes along that unless you're building an arm exactly like this for a shop just like this, enough of the dimensions and things are going to change that I'm not going to attempt to show how to build this exact gantry arm, etc., because the chances are almost non-existent that anybody will ever build anything just like this. But I do hope to show you that the design is scalable to a bigger arm or a smaller one, as long as the dimensions and proportions are adjusted accordingly. And that would be for uh, a heavier camera, might require a couple adjustments, a smaller shop, a lower ceiling, a taller ceiling, a wider shop, all those things are going to influence the ultimate design. But I hope by the end of this video, you'll see enough of the process to decide if it's something you want to tackle and if this design itself is worth adapting to your current situation. But let me crawl out of the weeds here and give you an overview of how this works 
starting with the camera itself. And obviously, this is the business end of the whole articulated arm. And no matter how long the arm is, all the fine adjustment is done right here. So it has to be very versatile and capable. And this whole thing starts out with this um, pivoting uh, attachment here, this hardware. This is called a Ulanzi claw. I'll have a link for that in the video description. And it allows me to put a, a shoe on the bottom of a camera. And then this just clips into place in the top of that claw. And under here, there's a locking mechanism. So now if I bump these things, the camera doesn't fall out. And this um, also has a 360 degree ball for rotation of the camera. And, it, and the, um, the clamp itself actually rotates so I can get the camera to go sideways. And that's, that's a great piece of hardware. I'll show you a close up of it here in a second. But I want to give credit for that. Um, if you go on YouTube for other overhead camera boom arms, you'll see a guy that says it's the longest arm on, uh, on YouTube, and it probably is uh, to date. But I saw that he used this Ulanzi claw, and I went and checked it out, and yeah, that's top notch. So I agree with his rating and approval of that. But let me give you a closer look at that piece of hardware while I'm talking about it. Yeah, so here's a close up. This is the lockout button here. I pop the camera out and it's kind of got this square looking shoe. This just screws into the fitting on the bottom of the camera. And the, this is the claw itself. There's a knob in the back here that locks this rotation of it like this. Uh, the knob, this knob is the one that whole, um, controls that um, little shoe here. And this slot is the one that can pivot down into that slot for putting the camera in uh, portrait mode versus landscaping mode. And you'll also see here that there's a cold shoe on the side of this mount. And uh, some people clip a light or something into that. I don't know if I'll ever use it. But uh, that's what that little piece of hardware looks like. It's super handy and not, not crazy expensive, but super um, functional. So that was a good buy. And in the bottom here, I might as well show you this while the camera's zoomed in. I've got... Um, a 3816 thread on this T nut. I just took a T nut with female threads and then I super glued a piece of 38s all thread in there. That's the right length to go through this base piece. I put this, um, this is just like a plastic shoe washer there so that this metal sits on plastic and the plastic sits on, sits on the wood. And um, I just made those pieces of hardware to fit like this. And then this screws in there. It's super functional handy, as I've been saying. And then, so my knob down here also controls the rotation of this, just like the knob on the back controls this. But there's a little indicator here and a 360 degree uh, readout on there. So you can use that for panning shots, etc. Although I don't foresee using this in that function. And I clip the camera back on here. And I don't normally use this telephoto lens. As this is just on my old camera. The, the short lens that I usually use went bad. So I, I put this on here just for demonstration purposes. But I will say that the extra weight of this lens, I have to tighten up joints farther up the arm to support extra weight. This still moves. I can make an adjustment like that, moving it up and down. But if there was more weight, Still, if I had a flash on here or whatever else, I would have to put more tension on the joints up above to support that weight. But it will support it with just a slight twist of the bolts that add a little more friction to those joints. And the next adjustment point is this right here. I got another knob similar to this one, and that allows me to pivot the camera around. Uh, sometimes the camera has to be outboard like this. If the boom arm's on the other side of the shop, etc., uh, the camera can swing around here and then um, I still have these other adjustments going on. But uh, sometimes it's important um, to have the camera out here on the outboard side of this piece. So there's an adjustment here for that. And the next connection up the arm is this one here. And I've got another T-nut just like those other two that screws into um, a threaded insert in this piece here, and that allows me to tip the camera like this. 
And I can combine that action with this action to get a straight down camera shot. Uh, there's all sorts of things here. This can tip up this way. Camera can tip around down this way. And as long as I get the strap out of the way, I'm going to have a clear shot of whatever I need to, to shoot down there. So that's a handy deal. Pivot this back around here. Something like that. And that's how the lower joints, connections, and hardware function. Um, I should say that most of the arm is made out of Russian birch plywood. I used half inch or uh, 14 millimeter, whatever it is. Um, for most of the arm, this particular piece down here is three quarter inch. I uh, just wanted it to be a little thicker uh, for function and looks. That's what that is. Um, but I breezed past this piece right here, which is um, kind of like the main handle for this whole thing. So I wanted that to be a nice piece, fit, function, and finish. So um, I made that out of, uh, that's a mesquite here. And if you look close from this angle, you'll see there's a stripe here. And that is six millimeter Russian birch plywood. I made a core for the handle. I guess I, you can see it here on the top of the handle. Uh, I made a core and then I laminated this mesquite on it. And because that's, that's kind of a special piece, it has a beautiful finish to it. That is just as smooth as can be with a gel poly finish. And I was pretty proud of that when I made it. It actually worked like I hoped. So I shot video of making this piece. That'll show up later in this video. You'll see that segment when I actually made this one. And I'll just do a voiceover of the work. And it's one of the more unique pieces of the whole setup. So I'll focus on that, like I said, later. But now I'll go up one more link on the camera boom arm um, and show you this piece here. This is a single layer of Russian birch plywood, half inch, like I said. And I wanted to add a little branding in a key spot like this, and I did that on the X-Tool laser, and I'll show that later as well, because that's kind of a special next level touch for the whole articulated arm. And now moving up the arm, we get to this next section here. Bring this down. And um, this section, as well as the other ones, um, also the half inch or 13 millimeter Russian birch, 14 millimeter, whatever it is. And the, all three arm sections are very similar other than their size and basic shape. But the main design feature of the arm is the fact that it starts out with one layer here. This is sandwiched between two layers. So in this joint, that supports the least amount of weight. There's minimal resistance. There's just two resistance or friction surfaces in here. Going up the arm, the next joint, there's two pieces here, fit in between three pieces. So there's one, two, three, four friction surfaces there because it's supporting this additional weight. Go up one more section and another section and the friction surfaces increase as the load increases. But it's pretty remarkable and I'm very pleased how little extra tension it really takes to support the extra weight because the amount of friction is multiplied each time and not just added. Kind of sounds and looks like an elephant, doesn't it? And here's a, a decent look at the third section of this arm. And this is a prime example of the benefit of having this camera arm in the first place. If I had another one of these, boy, I could get a, a good camera angle for this. But as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, this arm section is three layers. They're spaced apart for the two layers at the bottom. And the next arm section is spaced apart for these three layers. And as you'll see later in the video, all these arm pieces are made with templates and a flush trim router bit. This is a prime project for fabrication with a CNC. And I could have taken it to a friend with my digital files and he could have made these on his overarm CNC. But I wanted to show the Next Level Carpentry audience that CNC quality and design can be produced with simple templates and a flush trim router bit. So I kept it in shop, made all this stuff here. And the reason I chose uh, the Russian birch plywood for this, I think this, this half inch stuff has like seven or nine layers. It's extremely strong, rigid in this direction. It's lightweight as it is when, you, when it starts out, but then I made these cutouts to further reduce the weight and also add to the aesthetics of it. So it's kind of a win-win deal. But as long as I'm talking about the pros and cons of this, the goods and the bads and the design, the one thing that I'll say is that uh, these arms are super rigid in this direction, but they, they are able to twist. This arm twists like this, and that adds to some oscillation of the camera at the end that I have to steady out. 
And I said earlier in the video, if I start it over again, I might come up with a diff different design. And one of the things that I'd try to design out of this more is to reduce that torsional twisting in the arm. That'll make sense later when I talk about the next section of the arm. And here's yet another case in point. Uh, I've got the camera sitting on the end of my table saw to get this shot off the tripod, but I hope it gives you a good enough look at this upper arm section. I can swing this around. And you see that there's four layers here, same design principle as the last section we looked at, and the same design challenges. And that's why you can see in here, this silver bar, because um, when I first set this camera uh, boom arm up, the, uh, the torsional twist was exponential going up. And this section, even though it's four layers, and I had a, a bolt steadying it in the middle, it still had way too much flex in it. And that just amplified as it went down to the end of the arm. So I made a torsion bar that fits in here. And that's kind of another cool piece, like the mesquite handle down below. I fabricated the pieces for this, fit them in here. Then I took it over to my friend John Howard's shop, and he machined holes in it and TIG welded it for me. And I captured video of that work in a shop too. And you'll see more about this later in the uh, video when I assemble this upper arm section, but that torsion bar made a huge difference on the function and the stability of this upper arm section so that now the torsional twist is all down below and it, it steadies out a lot more easily than it did before I put that bar in here. And I think you can see the, there's lugs on the upper and lower end of that bar that give it that torsional rigidity. And let me adjust the camera one more time and talk about this. And I call this the pivot block for lack of a better term. And it's made of uh, five laminations that the four laminations of this upper arm section fit in between. So here there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight friction surfaces. And it doesn't take much uh, tension at all or much of an adjustment in this bolt. To, to make this connection very rigid. I don't move this very much because the lower end of the upper arm is well above my head and I get plenty of reach with this. But with that longer lens on the camera, I've got enough tension on this where it really doesn't move. I can loosen this ever so slightly and adjust it if I need more reach on the arm. But for the most part, this is a great position to leave this in. And that leads me to one of the most important design specifications for this whole thing to work. And that is the bearings that are up in here. Got to make sure I'm not swinging my camera into the workbench down there. But uh, obviously there's a fair amount of stress on this. Um, this arm, I haven't said it yet, but this arm can extend out over 10 feet long and it'll hold itself there just fine. But that's a lever 10 feet long that's putting strain on the bearings up here. So those need to be very robust. And you'll see it later in the video when I cover that section. And I feel like I came up with a very elegant solution to make that all rigid, yet still function smoothly so that I can move the camera with just a single finger down at the other end. And there's no play in this, um, this pivot and tilt mechanism up here where this plate pivots and this arm tilts. And so I don't have to get off the ladder again. I'll show you this, um, this plate here, that's the gantry plate. That's 3 8 inch thick aluminum. You'll see more on that uh, and how this is all put together when I assemble these pieces, even though I don't go through a great bit of detail on the actual fabrication. But that's 3 8 inch plate aluminum. And then I've got these wheels up here that ride on one inch tubing of the gantry track. And then up above are the tuber fours that I made for attaching this whole thing to the ceiling. And I teased about this whole camera setup in the Tuber 4 video that I'll link right here. But initially, I made these pieces uh, full length so I could stick them up on the ceiling. I'll show you that installation process later. And the purpose of those is that I could just screw these into the roof trusses that are up above here uh, at random intervals, wherever those are. And then I could put these crossbars on the gantry track and just screw those in every 20 inches along the way for a nice even layout because I didn't want to have to measure and place these steel bars exactly under roof trusses. So the tuber fours here serve as an interface between the connection to the roof and the gantry's connection 
to those uh, two plates. And last but not least, you saw this in operation earlier, although you probably didn't recognize it. Uh, this is a special hook. This is a tilted C hook here. And that makes a connection with this handle. It hooks in here so I can push and pull this when the, when the camera arm is out to the side. I, I can't really get the right kind of force on it. So this, this um, handle here allows me to move it, move the gantry this way regardless of the position of the arm. For instance, if it's out on the side like that, I can't really pull the arm from down there to make this happen. But then the, that arm just clips out, it's out of the way. And the whole operation of it is uh, quite satisfactory as it turns out. And I think that that wraps up an overview of the arm pretty well. Except uh, I guess this is as good a time as any um, to give an overview of the gantry track. Um, I decided to make this out of steel. It's just two uh, pieces of pipe on the outside, one inch pipe, and then there's one inch square tubing in between with holes for all that. This is all welded. I'll show you that later in the video. Although at one point I um, contemplated making this track out of like a two by 12 with rounded edges or a ladder panel with two by fours and rounded edges, but I thought steel was a lot more functional even though it takes it out of the range of capabilities for a lot of people in a lot of shops. But if this arm was five feet long and I had an eight foot ceiling, a two by 12 with bullnose edges would work fine with this setup. So keep that in mind so that you're not limited by an inability to weld steel because it would, it would still work with wood. Uh, but as long as I'm up here, I'll show you that uh, I've got rubber bumpers on the wall couple of rubber baby buggy bumpers down there that stop this on this end of the track. It all slides good. And away down here on the other end of the track, there's a couple more rubber bumpers that keep the gantry plate from going off the rails on the end. And you can see that my little gantry push pull handle has its own parking place on the end of my ceiling mounted flex dock storage rack. And I think it's remarkable and funny how much this arm looks and sounds like an elephant's trunk. That I think I'm going to nickname this the Packy Darm. But with that overview and review complete, I'm going to switch gears here. I'll put the camera onto the Packy Darm itself and dive into the part where you can see what the layout and fabrication process looks like for the arm overall and for the various templates involved in making that arm. And at the same time, you'll get to see the new and improved results I get with unlimited options for positioning the camera around the shop as I go about the work. And I'm going to start with the overall layout process for the arm itself. And I think it's fitting that I start this segment with the camera on the arm in a position that I couldn't achieve with the old man Frodo tripod because it gives you a good angle and good perspective of the layout work for the arm itself. And you can see here this long piece of white material. This is half inch particle board with a white melamine coating. And the important thing is that this piece is longer than the overall length of the camera boom arm from the top pivot way out to where the camera is. And the dimension I used for this arm was exactly nine feet from the top pivot to the last pivot on the double section of the arm. And I decided to make the arm in three segments. And this piece is around 12 feet long, so that's plenty of length. But obviously, if you're designing a shorter arm, a shorter piece is adequate. But I'll start at the, the top end or the big end of the arm to give you an overview of the steps that I used to create the elegant taper of the arm when it's extended full length and straight. And I'll start down at this end of the pattern piece on the wall next to the clamps after switching the camera to an overhead shot. I apologize for being so easily distracted, but I thought you might get a kick out of seeing what the articulated arm looks like with the camera mounted for this overhead shot that I'm about to take for the layout on this end of the boom arm. But the cool thing is that a shot like this is possible now because I can get the camera put up here instead of having it angled down like this, looking at the work area 
on the tripod where that camera is. So I think this will work. All right, so here's that shot. And as a reminder, the whole purpose of this exercise is to draw out a profile of the camera arm in its full extended position in full scale to establish proportions and dimensions for making patterns for making each of the separate camera arm sections. And I'll start using a double square to draw a line along the edge of this layout piece here from one end to the other. And that just gives me room to work here on the edge of the pattern so I'm not drawing the arm right on the edge of this piece. And I chose to make the diameter of the upper pivot piece of the upper arm six inches in diameter. So I've got this square set at four inches. So I'll draw a line here that's three inches away from that line. And I've got this compass set to exactly three inches. So I'll draw a line here in an arbitrary place. So that the crosshairs here serve as a center line for a circle with a three inch radius and a six inch diameter. And as I've been saying all along, uh, this boom arm in the shop here, it's nine feet exactly from the top of the center pivot to the other pivot um, just above the camera there. So I'm just going to drive a nail at the center point that I just drew from down here. So that I can hook a tape measure on there and come all the way down to this end and scribe an arc at nine feet. It's going to be right here. And I'll draw another arc at six feet and three feet in similar fashion. And so this arc represents the center of a circle that will get drawn after a few more steps. Now with those other two center arcs drawn, I'm back at the nine foot one here. This is the end of the arm. I've got a smaller compass. This is set for an inch and a half. So I can draw a mark on that center line and then draw this circle at the end. That represents the bottom pivot circle, for lack of a better term. Now, if the design for this arm was a, a nine foot arm, a single piece, this is all I need. I have both ends and I can set up the tapers for the arm itself. But as you know, the arm is going to be three pieces. I've got these other two center lines laid out here, but I don't know the diameter of the circles at these other two pivot points yet. So I'll grab this sweet new straight edge off the wall here. and use this to lay out the tapers for the other articulating joints in the boom arm. And I'll do that by laying the straight edge down on this layout piece and lining one edge up with the tangent points of those two circles. And I'll hold this in place with the clamp. so that nothing shifts while I draw that important line. And I'll throw in a little plug for uh, the patron audience here at Next Level Carpentry who know a bit of the backstory of this straight edge from a few patron only videos I've done during this build process. But once everything's set up and lined up, I'll just draw this line from the tangent point on the six inch circle all the way down to the tangent point on the three inch circle on this end. And those two lines establish the taper of the arm from the big end to the small end. And while I'm at it, I'll reposition the straight edge by bumping it into the nail on the big end of the arm layout and swinging it till it goes through the center line of the circle on the small end and draw another line. And in this view, you get a pretty good idea where I'm at with the layout process of the articulated arm so far. And now, assuming I've done everything right up to this point, I can lay out the diameter for the other two pivot points on this arm. And like I said at the beginning of the video, I'd be surprised if anyone ever builds an arm just like this. But using this sequence of steps, you can draw an arm of virtually any length with any number of pivots and any starting and ending diameter. 
because this simple geometric layout can be applied to any number of variables. And I'll also mention that I did a lot of these pre-calculations with my SketchUp model, and you can sure figure out this stuff all digitally by doing a similar construct and come up with an exact diameter for these other two circles. But I wanted to show you what the analog process I used for some of the layout work looks like and how it can be adapted to other projects. So let me bring the camera in on these other two pivot points as I draw circles that determine the diameter of those pivot points. And I realize that jeweled finish on the straight edge can be a bit distracting in a camera shot, but I'm kind of proud of that thing. So I'll leave it here for this one close up shot. But the process here is very simple. I'm just using this small compass and using this cross point here as the center of a circle. That's the exact diameter needed to fit in between those two tapered lines for the arm. And I'll repeat the process on this upper joint using the larger compass so that now I have circles of the right diameter laid out for all four pivot points on the arm. And this one looks like five inches. And I'll call this one four inches. And there's probably some math wizard out there that already knew what those dimensions were going to be. But I use a ruler for the less erudite among us. Once the overall layout is done, I can focus in on one of the arm sections. I'll just use this middle one for convenience and draw in a couple of the aesthetic changes that I use for the arm's design. And I don't need the arm to be this full width all the way through, so I offset it in a half of an inch. I can offset this side of the arm just by setting this square to an inch and a half. Like that, and then this edge isn't parallel to this edge, so I'll just use the straight edge here and line it up along the outside pencil mark there. Carefully like that, then I just take a piece of half inch material should be the same thickness as that. Yep, good enough. And I'll just draw this line along here. So now the two sides are offset in a half of an inch. And to make each of these arm sections uh, more stable or more rigid, I put a bolt through the middle. So in this case, I can just mark from center to center. That's still 36 inches. I'll put a mark at 18 and a mark at 19 and 17 for a two inch wide web there. And I can mark two inches at this end. And two inches down here at the same time. And this is kind of a random, non-geometrically perfect process, but I basically set the compass point at a center like that. Draw out to the edge, use that setting for a center mark and then draw a circle here. Oops, got ahead of myself. All right, the next, the next step is to make the width of those uh, pieces on the sides of these arms an inch wide. So I've got a strip an inch wide here. I'll just hold that down and draw a line. There and here, that makes the remaining part of the arm an inch wide. like that. And now I can go back to this step by setting the compass here for the width of this slot, like so. It's pretty close. Use that for a center mark. And then draw a half a circle down here. Like that. And then I'll repeat that same process on these other lines. And I'm not taking quite as much care here as I should. So some of these things don't line up quite like they can if you pay more attention, but this is all pretty close. You can see that touch is there, but not there. So I've gotten a little hasty with my sequence here, but you get the idea how to draw this part. And I'll do that for all four of these cutout circles. Like that. And that gives uh, a layout of the arm. I like the proportions. When I was designing this in the first place, I played around with different thicknesses on the sides, with and without this web in the middle, etc. But the process is the same for creating the proportions of this arm. And you can see the template that I made for the arm I'm currently using. 
And this is how I arrived at this shape, configuration, proportions, and dimensions. So now I'll quickly go through the process I used for making this from this. This pattern making sequence is bound to seem a bit simplistic and redundant because we already have all the answers to the test, but I'll go through the steps just the same. What I'll use for the actual pattern or template is a piece of this quarter inch MDF that has white melamine on the faces. And I put a couple of pieces of spec tape on the back just to hold it down here on the work surface so it doesn't slide around during layout. And just go through the steps of transferring this geometry to this piece. And I sure hope this camera setup is better for you because it's sure better for me because I'm not working around that tripod. But here's uh, the piece I've got laid down. This is five and a quarter inches wide. I need five inches, four feet long, and I need about three and a half feet. So I'll just start out with some basics here. And this is a five inch circle. So I'm just gonna come in three inches from the end here and draw a line for reference there. And then I'll put a mark at two and a half inches for the center and then mark that five inch circle here, just like that. And notice this time I drew the circle tangent to the edge because that's the end of the pattern there. And now I can put an arc down here at three feet and use a compass set to two inches to draw a circle on the other end of this pattern. Then I'll take a shorter but noticeably duller straight edge and draw a line tangent to the tops of both those circles. I'll reset my double square to a half inch to mark this side of that offset and use my scrap block and straight edge to draw the offset on the other side of the arm. After that, I'll line up the one inch wide strip with those lines and pencil in the one inch width of the main web of the arm. Now I can draw the center mark for the bolt and the web at 18 inches from each end and do the two inch layout for the width of the webs at three locations, top, middle, and bottom and follow up with a center line down the entire length of this section of the arm. And with those marks in place, I'll retrace the steps and draw the rounded ends for the cutouts in the arm. And you can see this circle doesn't want to line up. And when I double check, I see that I'm an inch and an eighth at this end, one inch at that end, so this line must have slipped when I was drawing it. And one reason I like this melamine faced MDF is because lacquer thinner takes pencil marks off there like nobody's business. So I can take another shot at getting this right. Yeah, that's more like it right there. And I'll leave that in the video sequence just to show you that's kind of a double check for accuracy, et cetera, in the process. And those things sometimes happen, which is no big deal because they are so easily corrected. Just like that mistake there. Go from the two inch wide mark, transfer the center, and then draw a half circle around that center like that. And last but not least, I finish up with the last cutout end with a swipe of the compass. And bear in mind, when these pieces get made, I'll drill a quarter inch hole here for a bolt to sandwich the pieces together. And both of these ends of the arm will get half inch holes for the bolts that sandwich the joints together and provide friction to hold the arm in place. And that completes the layout. And I can proceed to fabrication next. And I'll start fabricating at the drill press by drilling a 1 16th inch hole through each of the arm pivot centers and one through the center of the center web for the bolt that sandwiches these pieces together. Then I continue the process of making a template for this section of the arm by using Forstner bits to drill holes at the ends of the cutouts. And you gotta love a Lambrick keyless chuck for how quick and accurate it makes the process of drilling sequential holes of different diameters. After that, I deploy a lowly jigsaw to finish roughing out the cutouts in this template. 
I don't take any extra pains roughing out these cutouts. And as long as I don't hit the layout lines, it's good to go. And you'll see why later. Now I can head over to the bandsaw to rough trim the outside outline of this section of the template. But if you don't have a bandsaw, carry on with the jigsaw to trim out the template close to those lines, but not through the lines. Naturally, a bandsaw isn't the only way to make cuts like this, but it's so slick and quick, it's definitely the way to go if you have access to one. My goal while cutting out the template at this stage is to cut really close to the line on the rounded ends because I've got to sand those to fit. But I've got to trick up my sleeve for the long straight sections, so I just cut those quickly and leave plenty of margin between the cut line and the layout line. And if making a template like this seems tedious in this video, I can assure you that once you've kind of got this process into your mindset and your workflow, this really is a quick and efficient process. And I used it uh, to make all the templates for the other sections of the arm. And once you're set up, have the pieces laid out, you just go from one machine to the next, doing all these steps on each piece. It definitely goes quick enough even to the point that for a one-off piece like this, which is the last section of the arm, I made a template of it rather than just rough cutting the piece uh, to this shape out of the Russian birch plywood and then sanding it from there. And if you don't believe me yet, I hope by the end of this video, I've convinced you because the process really does allow you to do CNC work in a shop like this. And that's where CNC stands for carpenter navigated control not computer navigated control. Now that this template is roughed out, I'm going to show you some advanced template making techniques so I don't have to use files and sandpaper to refine the template. And the technique I'm going to show you is how to use a template to make a template. And this is a pretty simple process. If you remember, the space between these two lines is one inch. And I have this one inch strip of Russian birch plywood to use for this. And I'll deploy some spec tape here. And I put tabs on there because this one will keep these pieces from vibrating and chattering as I do the flush trimming process. But once the step spec tape is down, make sure there's no sawdust on my straight edge, my pattern piece here, and then I stick it down carefully right along the pencil lines that I drew earlier. And those are also the tangent points of these two circles. And there's a little bit of material sticking out on both sides of that piece of one inch plywood. And in the router here, I've got a half inch flush trim bit, quarter inch shank top bearing, chucked into my MLCS Powerlift Pro router table here. I've got the bit height set so it rides on the pattern and cuts the workpiece. And I've got a starter pin here to begin the process because I don't want the router bit to hit the circle here on the end of the pattern. I just want to clean this up here. And this is what it looks like. And now I have two perfectly straight beams on this side of this template. And notice that I stopped the routing process short of the tangent points on these circles. And I'll clean that up later after I flush trim this other side. And now it's a second verse, same as the first, but hopefully shorter, but not any worse. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all there is to that. Once that quick step is taken care of, I'll actually resort to old school methods to finish refining this template. I start by using a small drum sander on the drill press to clean up the tangent points between the drilled holes and the straight lines I just routed. And as I'm doing this, I keep in mind that ultimately the workpiece is only going to look as good as the template. So I approach this with caution so I don't spoil the pattern in the process. Because a disc sander would be better than a drum sander for truing up the outside diameter of the end pivot circles. And I don't have a disc sander. I use an 80 grit best block for demanding sanding to do the finishing touches for truing up the end pivots. And I can easily check my work by setting a compass to a slightly smaller radius and using that sanding block to sand it to a margin until the shape is perfect to my satisfaction. And with that little bit of hand tune up, this template is done 
And you don't have to take my word for this, but when I lay it down here on the initial layout piece, it's a perfect match. So this template is now ready to head to the CNC, which is the Carpenter Navigated Control, where I'll make a piece shaped like this out of this piece of half-inch Russian birch. And this process is pretty straightforward. I merely lay the template on the workpiece, leaving a little bit of margin at all the corners for trimming, and then use a sharp writer pencil to quickly and carefully trace around the inside of all these openings and around the perimeter of the piece. And that's why I like sharp writer pencils. I can just twist a little extra lead out there to replace it as it gets burnt up and it draws a fine point the whole time. And voila, layout for the center section of the pachyderm is complete. I start the fabrication process back at the drill press, retracing my steps using a selection of bit sizes to drill rounded ends for the cutouts, only this time leaving margin between the layout line and the hole for flush trimming with the router bit in an upcoming step. And now viewers that anticipate I'll use the jigsaw to finish these cutouts get bonus points. And if you take those bonus points and a $5 bill to your local coffee shop, they'll give you a free cup of coffee. As before, my next move is back over to the bandsaw to rough cut the outer perimeter of this arm section. But it works equally well to carry on with a jigsaw if you don't have access to a bandsaw. And because it's effortless to flush trim this piece with a router bit, I'm pretty cavalier about how close I get to the layout line at this stage of the game. And now it's time to attach the pattern to the workpiece. And I'll do this with a combination of things that you've seen before. The first is to put some spec tape on the middle of these arm sections. And that just keeps the pattern from chattering during the routing process. And then I just stick the pattern onto the workpiece approximately on the layout lines made earlier. It doesn't have to be exact as long as there's margin all the way around the outside. And then I'll use number eight by five eighths nails to finish attaching the pattern to the workpiece. And now you know why I drilled those little holes in the pattern earlier. They not only serve to hold these two pieces together at this stage, but they double as center marks when I go to drill holes in each piece of the arm later. And by using the centers made with the pattern, all the holes line up during final assembly. And now I'll use the PowerPro app to adjust the height of the flush trim router bit so the top bearing on this half inch diameter flush trim bit rides on the template high enough to flush trim the half inch workpiece underneath. And a simple tap on the touchscreen raises the bit precisely a quarter of an inch to align both the bearing and the cut. Now I'll back the camera up and park it so you can watch the flush trimming process of shaping the workpiece to this pattern. And yes, your eyes aren't deceiving you. I am wearing gloves the entire time while working with the power tool with a spinning bit. But I'll make a special note here that these aren't ordinary gloves, but special gloves I wear for grip. I call them Smurf gloves because they have a blue rubber coating on them that provides grip so I maintain control of the workpiece. Yes, if my hand gets caught in the spinning bit wearing these gloves, the damage is gonna be much worse. But I wear them to maintain control of the workpiece with a good grip to minimize the prospect of injuring my hand without gloves if they slip. And once the dust is settled, I use a putty knife to pry the pattern away from the workpiece to reveal a perfectly produced CNC part. And you can see by the struggle that the combination of spec tape and center nails is perfect for the flush trimming process. The next fabrication step is back at the drill press where I use center marks made by those nails to drill a half inch pivot hole at each end of the arm and a hole for a quarter inch bolt in the center of the arm. Once shaping and drilling are complete, you can see that the workpiece is an exact match to the pattern and I can use an eighth inch roundover bit to ease edges that are exposed when the arm is assembled. And this step is a bit of a special occasion because the brand new Bosch Colt router I got from longtime subscriber and patron Eric, who goes by the initials EVS, is getting its video debut on YouTube in this segment. And notice that I stopped short of going around these end pivots with that rounding over, because when these are sandwiched together, I don't want a little quirk joint between the pieces. And as a technicality, only the outside faces 
of two of the three pieces I'll end up making get rounded over because that's all that's exposed in the final assembly. And that pretty well wraps up the live fabrication portion of this video. And I hope you're able to see how to extrapolate the thought process and steps that I used to get to this place for this piece and apply those to all the rest of the pieces for the camera boom arm that you see here. And also to the various pieces parts. Uh, this little part here is the pivot block at the top made in a very similar fashion to this with a pattern template. The piece here for the little camera arm here on the bottom. And then even so far as the discs that make up the connection here and here. As I segue into voiceover for video I shot while actually building this boom arm, I'll ask you to subscribe to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. After all, it's free, you know, and subscribers that click the bell icon are first to be notified when I upload new in-depth content like this to the channel, and I appreciate it. Now, if you'll do me a solid and gently click that thumbs up icon while you're at it, the quants over there at YouTube will take notice of that thumbs upage and give Next Level Carpentry a ratings boost that helps me compete with all those popular channels out there that are doing videos on live edge epoxy river table charcuterie boards and such. And I'll thank you for that in advance. As expected, you'll find links in the video description below to most of the tools, supplies, and swag that you see me using and wearing in this video. Purchases through any of those affiliate links pay small commissions to next level carpentry that help justify the time and effort I spend producing videos like this with in-depth premium content that you can watch for free here on YouTube without a membership paywall, which is about as sweet as a self-licking ice cream cone, if you ask me. Last but not least, I want to give a big thumbs up and shout out to all the patrons of Next Level Carpentry on Patreon. I call patrons the Above and Beyond group for their generous financial support for the channel and sharing special in-depth behind the scenes content in patron only videos to a troll free audience on a more regular basis is both refreshing and enjoyable. So if joining that above and beyond group is something that interests you, follow the link to Patreon in the video description below and take advantage of a little extra hang time here in the next level carpentry shop with a group of dedicated and engaged fellow patrons. I got to admit, I'm already getting spoiled having this packing arm to hold my camera for video work here in the shop. So I'll just have to deal while shooting these fill in segments from a tripod, which kind of makes me wonder how I got along without it for so long. In this first segment, I'll cover the process that I used to make two 22 foot long two by fours that I used to attach the gantry track to the ceiling of the shop. And I feel a little bit like a flight attendant doing the pre-flight thing where they show you the exits and point to the masks that drop from the ceiling above. If you already watched the video I did showing in depth how I made super long tuber fours, you can skip ahead to the next segment in this video at this timestamp because this segment will be more of an overview and it might be old news. Like all millwork projects, I start making the mounting boards by flattening one face of four 12 foot long construction lumber two by fours on my joiner to begin converting them to millwork grade quality wood with one perfectly flat face without twist or cup. The second step is to run those two by fours flat face down for multiple passes through my DeWalt DW735 thickness planer until the top face is flat and parallel to the bottom jointed face. Next, with two wide faces flat and smooth, I go back to the joiner to straighten one narrow edge of each piece until each piece has three true faces. When each piece has three true faces, I put the straightened edge against the rip fence of my trusty old Delta Unisaw and rip the opposite edge straight, true, and parallel. Even though I'm working alone here, a grow outfeed roller stand lifts and supports the long leading end of the boards as they come off the back of the table saw so I can rip these long pieces safely, accurately, and consistently. Once all four pieces are ripped straight and to consistent width, I run the cut edge over the joiner again to remove minimal saw cut marks and leave a nice, smooth, plain surface on the boards to complete the conversion from construction lumber to millwork grade boards suitable for installation in the next level carpentry shop. So I lay them on my worktop for the next step. I quickly decide which boards to match when they're joined together, plan angle cuts, and then trim one end of each piece nice, clean, and square with the miter saw. 
To start the scarf joints, I overlap the pieces by exactly 24 inches, mark the centers of the joints at 12 inches, and use a framing square to draw layout lines across the pieces. Next, I use a piece of half-inch melamine-faced particle board as a straight edge to draw an accurate line for a jig to lay out and cut the scarf joints on one end of the board ends. Then I add strips of spec tape, double-sided tape, to the board, line up the straight edge with the layout line, and stick it to the tape. The next step for making this jig is to stand the board on edge, spritz the jig with Starbond CA glue accelerator, put a bead of Starbond medium-thick flexible CA glue on the back of a two-inch wide strip of the particle board, and stick it to the angled piece. After waiting about 20 seconds for the glue to set, I remove the jig from the board and peel off the spec tape to complete the jig. To use the jig, I just line it up with layout lines, transfer the joint center mark from workpiece to pattern, and retrace the scarf joint cut line, repeating the process on all four pieces of these two two-by-fours. Once joint layout is done, I use my six and a half inch Makita 18 volt circular saw to rough cut the scarf joint about an eighth inch proud of the layout line. Now it's time to put the jig to use. As before, I add strips of spec tape to the board, align the jig to the layout line, and then stick the jig to the tape on the workpiece. With everything in place, I use a half inch shank top bearing flush trim bit in a handheld router to trim the scarf joint face flush to the angle of the jig. I do this in two steps to get a fine point on the thin end of the scarf cut. I repeat the process on all four boards, then reorient the pieces for an initial dry fit of the joint so you can see the 22 foot long tuber force shaping up in this handheld shot. And I can switch back to real time video with dialogue where I start by routing slots for splines that strengthen an already strong joint design. There's plenty of surface area for glue strength on these 24 inch long scarf joints, but because I've got to do a lot of manhandling of these long pieces once they're glued together, I'm going to add a next level measure for extra strength by adding a spline. I start out by ripping cross grain strips of six millimeter thick Russian birch plywood to exactly 15 sixteenths of an inch wide for the splines. And to make slots for the six millimeter thick splines, I'm using a slot cutting bit on an arbor on a half inch shank in a handheld router so I can route those slots accurately and consistently. I choose a slot cutter that cuts a slot just a little bit narrower than the thickness of these six millimeter splines and then set the bit depth so that I route the same distance in from both faces of the scarf joint and end up with a slot that's perfectly centered between the faces and it's just the right width for a snug fit of these six millimeter by 15 16 inch splines. And I go with a 15 16 inch width because the slot cutter cuts a half inch deep It'll make a slot that's one inch deep, and I don't want this to bind in there, so I leave myself a sixteenth of an inch of play for glue and fit up. I do a test run of the spline slot by routing slots in two of the cutoff scraps that were left over when initially cutting the scarf joints. And notice that I route the slot from both faces of each piece, because when the bit is set at the right height, that'll center the slot perfectly between the faces on both pieces. And with a little trial and error during the setup, I get a slot that's the exact right width and the exact right depth for a perfect flush fit of these two pieces. Because I don't want the splines to stick out on the thin edge of the scarf joint, I've marked seven inches either direction from the center line, and I'll use that for the length of the spline slot that I route into these pieces. So that I get the strength of the spline without the unsightly splintering of the ends of those scarf joint points. Then with everything dialed in and set up, I can confidently route slots for the splines on each of the scarf joint faces from both faces of the pieces. After routing the slots, I check them for fit and mark the splines so I can cut them to length and round the ends for a perfect fit. And with a football shaped end on each end of the splines, they slip into the slots and when the center marks are lined up, two halves of the splined scarf joint come together perfectly. Oh yeah, and I think it's pretty sweet that at this stage, with just the spline in place and no glue, the joint's already strong enough to lift a board that's over 20 feet long by one end, and it'll only get better with some glue. This is when time spent doing homework pays off, because with a properly cut and prepared joint, glue up is a matter of simply slathering both sides 
of the joint and the spline with some tight bond two premium wood glue, sliding the pieces together, making sure the center marks are lined up, and finishing up with a couple squeeze clamps and a couple of screw clamps to hold the joint while the glue sets. Because the taper of this scarf joint is so long and flat, plus it includes a spline, there's no slippage in alignment of the joint as clamp pressure is brought to bear. Once all the clamps are tightened and glue squeeze out is finished, I use sawdust and a putty knife to clean up that extra glue squeeze out while the glue is still fresh. And using sawdust for glue cleanup on wood like this is a whole lot better than using warm water and wet rags because the wood is relatively soft and porous and any diluted glue that would soak into the wood would just make a sloppy looking joint when it's done. And once I'm done cleaning up both the workpiece and the glue protector, I let the joint sit for a couple hours with heat from the furnace and good clamp pressure to give the joint maximum strength from the glue up. After giving the glue a couple hours to set up, I can pop the clamps, scrape a little excess glue off the joint, and belt sand the splice to finish up this exercise in board stretching. And after those few steps, I think you'll agree that that is a pretty sweet splice. And once that belt sanding's done, you can see the end result, which is a two by four, that for all intents and purposes is a single piece and at this stage, it's about 22 feet long. How's about that? And for any doubters out there, here's an eagle eye view from the end of the board to prove the point that there's no way you can tell where that scarf joint is by eyeballing down the length of the board. The last step for preparing this piece for installation on the ceiling is to use a 3 16 inch round over bit and a handheld Bosch Colt router to ease the two sharp corners that will be exposed once the piece is attached to the ceiling. And I follow that with a little touch up sanding with 120 grit on a gator sanding block to clean up and smooth out the surface of the board before applying a sprayed lacquer finish. And keep in mind that you are looking at the spliced part of this board in this shot. At this point in the actual build, I was still developing both design and engineering of all the various boom arm details. So I did an initial assembly of all the parts I had made to this point to assess my progress. This still shot shows when I first assembled all three arm segments, connected them to the top pivot block, and stood the assembly upside down on the shop floor. Once I was satisfied with the strength of the arm and friction generated by the joints, I made an 18 inch diameter pivot plate out of 3 quarter inch plywood, screwed it to a sheet metal lazy sousing bearing, screwed that to a scrap of three quarter inch plywood and screwed the whole assembly to the shop ceiling for a test. After putting the initial assembly through some paces, I was happy with its nine foot reach, overall function and design at this stage, so I shifted gears a bit and worked to figure out the business end of the arm. In this shot, you can see the whole arm with the articulating camera mount and camera in place for the first time. This is when I figured out that I needed to add a torsion bar of some sort to the upper arm section and also realized that it was going to require more than a cabinet grade lazy Susan pivot bearing to handle the leverage generated by nearly 12 foot of boom arm and camera. I'll use this last still shot showing a close up of the arm extension and camera mount as a segue into fabrication of those parts. The fabrication process is involved enough for a dedicated video, but I decided to ignore YouTube algorithm recommendations for video length and include footage I shot making this laminated mesquite handle Serial number 0001. After milling some mesquite I had on hand to about two inches wide and about five eighths of an inch thick, I cut simple miters on the pieces and used medium thick flexible CA glue to glue them into two L shaped pieces. I also cut a piece of six millimeter Russian birch plywood into an L with legs exactly an inch and a quarter wide and a one inch radius on the inside of the L and a concentric three and a half inch radius on the outside of the L. Here I used a rip fence on my table saw and a putty knife to carefully align parts and then use tight bond three glue for laminating the handle pieces together. With pieces carefully positioned flush on the outside of the L, I shoot 23 gauge pin nails at the ends of the assembly where they'll get cut off later when the handle is trimmed. While the glue is still wet, I use sawdust and a sharp putty knife to clean squeeze out off the piece, saw fence and saw top. Next. I deploy a small battalion of F clamps to apply more than adequate pressure to maximize strength and appearance of the handle when it's finished. When glue is dry and clamps are removed, I use a half inch diameter bottom bearing flush trim bit in my router lift to flush trim the outer edge of the mesquite to the outer edge of the Russian birch core lamination. As you'll see, 
Sequence of the steps for making this handle are important for safety and success. Once the outer edge is flush trim clean, I set a stair at double square to an inch and a quarter to match the width of the Russian birch core and draw a line on one face of the handle blank. Then it's over to the band saw where I trim close as I dare to that layout line to remove most of the waste from the piece. Next, it's back to the router lift to flush trim the inside edge of the handle that is now an inch and a quarter wide and inch and a quarter combined thickness. Experience tells me that making unusual shapes like this can be dicey and dangerous, so I set about with these steps to minimize the risk to within my comfort zone. The first step for safety is to drill eighth inch pilot holes into the waist at each end of the L handle blank with the drill press. Then I chase those pilot holes with a drill bit to transfer them into a block of s crap. Now I can align the pieces and, using those pilot holes, drive screws to hold the workpiece to this temporary handle. With a 5 8 inch roundover bit in the router lift and using the starter pin, I carefully put that 5 8 inch radius on the bottom face of the laminated handle. Notice that careful placement of the screws keeps them out of this routing operation. Next, I flip the handle over and use the shank of small T-handle drivers to align pilot holes again so I can redrive screws that hold the temporary handle to the workpiece. Since I've never made a piece just like this before, I was unsure of how this step was going to work, so I approached it with caution by lowering the roundover bit to take smaller cuts to avoid a fracas. As it turns out, the L shape of the workpiece and the large handle that acted as a de facto cut guard made me confident and comfortable with this step, so completing the full roundover profile was a complete success. Not bad for an experimental prototype, right? Once shaping of the handle is done, I used a rip fence and a rule to mark the length of both legs of the L and then carefully cut off sacrificial length, square and true, with the miter saw. With the hard part of the camera mount out of the way, I went back to the band saw to cut 2 inch and 3 inch discs for the pivoting positioning connections of the arm extension and for the 20 inch long arm extension itself. I used a hybrid templating slash safety handle process like I used for the mesquite handle to trim the small discs because it's really hard to get blood stains out of this light colored Russian birch if I cut my fingers. I'm not narrating all the details of the process, but this sequence shows what it looks like. I chose to use the flush trimming process to prove it can be done, but I imagine many others would prefer using a disc sander to shape them. The 20 inch extension arm and camera support pieces were made with the same template process as the larger arm pieces, so I didn't show the actual fabrication steps here. Once the 20 inch extension arm was shaped and drilled, I fired up my X-Tool P2 55 watt laser and engraved stacked next level carpentry text into both faces of the arm. To make this text sharp and crisp, I programmed the P2 for a second burn to score the outline of all the engraved letters. Observant viewers will notice different text and a cool logo on the arm extension in different scenes in this video because I decided to switch to text that was baseline aligned to match the shop door layout, then infilled the text with mesquite colored mica powder and 75 minute epoxy from Starbond to further enhance the look of the text in the finished arm extension. After finishing all the pieces parts of the boom arm, the camera mount, and those mounting boards, I switched the shop from woodworking mode to spray finishing mode by covering up my table saw with protective cardboard and laying everything out for access for the spray application process. Spray finishing is a topic for a whole series of videos, so this is just an overview to show why I like this method for applying a finish to so many complicated pieces. Because it's quick, it's clean, it's easy, and the end result is, well, remarkable in my humble opinion. Here I'm using a 3M AccuSpray Gravity Feed Cup Gun to shoot a first coat of satin sheen Eurocat lacquer from Diamond Vogel on one face of all the pieces except the mesquite handle which gets a gel poly finish. I start by coating the 22 foot long mounting boards which is a great example of the efficiency of using spray applied lacquer as a finish. Following that I switch to detail mode and spray all 10 pieces of the boom arm plus the pivot disc and camera mount parts. Well, I gave these parts about a half an hour uh, after spraying the first coat, and so naturally I can just flip everything over. And when I was spraying, I guess the main thing that I'll say is the biggest part of spray finishing anything is all about the edges. You notice that I'm doing odd angles with the gun, trying to get these edges and the inside edges of these cutouts, etc. 
I drew all the edges and then on a skinny part like this, by the time the edges are done, the middle is pretty much done. Uh, so I don't, a lot of times I don't even end up giving it a finished coat. But as the parts get wider, I have to uh, do some extra spraying, especially on a part like this where I do the whole edge and then fill out the middle with the coat of the lacquer. So there's really not much to this. Um, but I, after, after the first side is dry, I can just go through and flip everything around. And the second verse is the same as the first. Well, here I am back again. I uh, don't remember where I left off uh, with the dialogue, but all the parts have been sanded, uh, blown off, cleaned up, laid back out. I sprayed a second coat on all these parts, so they're good to go. And I, all I got to do now is flip them over and put a second coat on the rest of everything. And probably the main thing at this stage is when I flip them over, I try to put them back where they were so that it's not fresh lacquer on fresh lacquer because these sticks have lacquer on them. Uh, worst case scenario, I get a little sticky spot, which is easy enough to clean up if it shows. Worst, worst case scenario, I can just sand it and put a, a third coat, but none of it should come to that, especially on these parts uh, with the nature of everything. The two long boards I've got over there, they're second coated already. And uh, so spraying this coat's pretty much the same as before. Uh, as I work through this process, I gain a little knowledge about uh, the angles for the spray gun and the order to spray things in. So that's helpful. Each coat goes a little better um, with the lacquer. After the first coat, uh, that first coat really soaks in, especially to end grain and stuff. And with this particular product, most wood lacquers these days, they're self-sealing. Uh, in the old days, you used to buy a gallon of sealer and a, buy a, a, a gallon of lacquer. But uh, nowadays, this stuff's pretty much self-sealing. The first coat of the product is the sealer and it, it, it soaks into the wood so far and sets up. So the, the subsequent coats lay on top. So they, they lay down a little different, looks a little different when you're spraying it, but it still takes about the same amount of material to do a coat. Um, it's just not soaking in it, but it needs that amount um, of material to lay on top to get a nice sheen. So, um, that's what uh, that looks like at this point. And I'm not gonna add more uh, of the spraying part. You kind of already know what that looks like. Because these parts sandwich together, I'm gonna let this stuff dry extra long, you know, like 36 to 48 hours before I put anything together because I don't want any of that lacquer sticking to itself because it's like glue at that stage. With all the wood parts for the boom arm, camera mount, and gantry track mounting boards complete, I switched gears from woodworking and spraying mode to metal fabrication and welding mode to make the steel part of that gantry track itself. An unexpected challenge for this design was how do I transport 24 foot lengths of steel for the gantry track rails and cross tubes from the steel warehouse back here to the next level carpentry shop. I could have had the steel delivered or asked a friend to haul it on a roof rack or borrowed a trailer, but where's the adventure in that? In the end, I acted on the suggestion from a friend to pull a MacGyver move and haul those long lengths of steel tubing slung underneath my pickup. No doubt many viewers will have a similar reaction to the dudes at the steel warehouse when I showed up in my extended cab short box pickup to haul 24 foot lengths of steel tube. When they asked, hey, where do you want it? And I said, eh, just lay it there on the pavement. They reacted with skeptical disbelief. When I straddled the pipe by driving over it with my pickup, I could just hear him thinking, this OG is crazy. And as I proceeded to use multiple wraps of rebar tie wire to sling the steel up from tow hooks and bumper brackets and a nylon strap between the cab and the bed to support the middle of those long lengths of steel tubing, they disappeared like a snowball in the Sahara to disassociate themselves completely from this process. After an uneventful 15 minute drive home from the steel warehouse, I released the strap, clipped the wires, and slid the 24 foot lengths of pipe into my shop where I started the fabrication process of making spreader bars for the gantry track. Using my Evolution metal cutting chop saw, I cut the one inch square tube into seven pieces, roughly 40 inches long, to make 14 individual spreader bars. Next, 
I used a framing square to mark all the pieces at 20 inches. Then I drew a center line on each tube and used a center punch at the center point to act as a drill guide. I made a drilling fixture for the drill press to hold the tubes while I used a one inch hole saw to drill through the square tube. This setup creates perfect round notches in one end of each half of the long piece while effectively cutting it in half at the same time. I use a good shot of cutting oil and firm pressure to drill all the way through the tube, generating a decent plume of smoke in the process. After each one inch hole is drilled, I have to remove the hole saw from its arbor to eject the wicked sharp slug cut from the tube, but the resulting round notches are worth the extra steps involved for making the notches this way. After all the tubes are notched on one end in this manner, I use a flat disc and an angle grinder to deburr the round notches for a sweet fit between square tubes and round tubes for the rails. In the next step, I screw a piece of one inch round dowel into the drilling fixture to act as a stop for notching the other end of each square tube for a finished width of 18 inches on center for the gantry track. With the stop in place, I slip the notched end of each square tube into the fixture, use a clamp to secure it in place, and repeat the drilling process as before to create another perfect rounded notch on the opposite end of each tube. I finish the spreader bars by deburring these notches as before and then double check length and fit by positioning pieces on a full scale layout of a cross section of the gantry track to confirm the final overall outside measurement of the track at the 19 inch width I planned. Once all the spreaders are deburred and checked for length, I switch out the drilling fixture with an end stop, clamp the pieces in place and drill a 5 16 inch hole all the way through the square tube in both ends of each one. These holes are for torch lags I'll use to attach the gantry track to the mounting boards during final installation. While I'm still in mass production mode, I lay all the tubes out and deburr all the holes using a countersink for a better fit and finish, and to keep from slicing my pinkies on razor sharp edges of the drilled holes. With the spreaders complete, I cut the rail tubes to identical length at 20 feet 1 inches long for the planned length of the gantry track for my shop. After cutting the tubes, I use a sharpie marker to lay out spacing for the spreaders at 20 inches on center for the full length of one tube and then square those marks across to the other tube for identical layout. To showcase the versatility of the next level carpentry shop, I switch gears once again from metal fabrication to welding. And since I'm much more of a carpenter than a welder, I use what I'm familiar with to get accurate results here. Because it's so important that the width of this track be very consistent, I made a pair of inside-outside width gauges by drilling and notching quarter-inch MDF to use while tap welding spreader bars in place. Slipping the two pieces into place on track tubes holds them at exactly 19 inches outside-to-outside outside so the roller wheels can ride unrestricted on the gantry track. With gauges in place and a spreader tube in position, I tack weld both ends to set the overall width of the track. Then I remove the gauges and finish tack welding the spreader tube in place. With the first spreader in place, I put a second spreader into position, double check layout marks, slip gauges into place, and tack weld the second spreader in place. With the first two spreaders tack welded in position, I use a squeeze clamp to square the assembly before repeating the tack weld process for the rest of the spreaders on the rest of the track. I check and double check squareness and layout each step of the way to avoid accumulation of error as I go. I finish up with the last spreader at the other end of the track by tack welding it in place flush with the ends of the rail tubes. Once all 13 spreaders are tacked in place, I use a scrap of half inch HDF I notched to fit between the track tubes to hold the track vertically for better positioning as I weld the rounded notches of the spreader tubes to the track tubes. Welding all 52 rounded notches takes a while, but this vertical setup allows me to make cleaner welds on both rails because I can flip the whole track top for bottom after the first 26 welds are made. After I finish welding rounded notches, I lay the track flat and weld the straight part of the notch to the rail tubes. Even though this isn't necessary for strength, I do it to get the fit and finish I want for the completed track. Once welding is finished, I use the notch panel again to hold the track vertically to make grinding my welds easier. Real welders will scoff at this step because their welds don't need the cosmetic grinding that mine do. But hey, I freely admit that I can weld, but I'm definitely more of a grinder than a welder. Using a Metabo 5-inch angle grinder, I spend as much time as it takes 
first with the track standing on edge and then laying down to shape all the fillets and flats to my satisfaction, approaching each weld from whatever angle makes it easiest. After grinding all the welds to shape, I switch to a sweet 80 grit round edge flat disc and give every weld everywhere a quick once over to smooth out scratches from grinding and to erase evidence of my shortcomings with my welding abilities. The next step is to prep the track for paint. I go over everything with a 120 grit disc sanding screen to remove weld spatter, mill scale, and a general cleanup. I wipe everything down with lacquer thinner on a towel and then give the entire track a coat of rattle can gray primer in two coats. A thin tack coat followed by a full even wet coat. After the primer dries, I thoroughly scuff it with a medium Scotch-Brite pad and proceed to spray apply the final finish of hammerite gray in the same two coat process I used for the primer. The result is a very decent finish that looks like powder coat without all the fuss. I shift gears once again from welding and painting to fabrication to make a dolly plate to run on the gantry track. I start with a piece of salvage 3 8 inch thick aluminum plate that's cut to about 20 inches by 24 inches. After careful layout, I drill six holes for screws that will attach two heavy duty Lazy Susan bearings to the plate. Next, I use screw wax on a 1224 tap to quickly thread those six pilot holes for accepting stainless steel 1224 oval head machine screws later during assembly. Because the aluminum plate was salvaged, it was pitted, so I used a 100 grit belt on a belt sander to give it a cleaner brushed aluminum finish. The pitting was worse than I realized, so I just did the best I could to cosmetically rescue the piece. I drilled half inch diameter holes for dolly wheel axle bolts at four corners of the plate off camera. In this segment, I use a half inch rat tail file to elongate two of those holes to allow some adjustment in the spacing of the wheels so it will roll smoothly on the track. Here you can see about an eighth inch of adjustment for the axle bolt in the elongated slot. Now you can see the dolly wheel set up with its half inch bolt axle plus nuts and washers for spacers so the wheels are secure but can spin freely. After adjusting spacing between the rollers in those elongated slots, I slip the dolly plate onto the gantry track for a quick test roll. Satisfied with the rolling action, I add four stationary safety blocks by driving 3 8 16 bolts into holes pre-drilled and tapped into the plate. These four safety blocks will prevent the dolly plate, boom arm, and camera from crashing down onto my head should any of the dolly wheels fail from stress from leverage from the boom arm during use. It's been a long time from initial concept of this gantry system until now when I finally get to see the whole thing together and working. So I'm one happy camper right about now. Even though I won't go into a great deal of detail or specifics, I want to show you how a couple of key components, the pivot block assembly and the upper arm section, go together. I'll start with the pivot block and the pivot plate because the design and components aren't obvious, but particulars are important. The pivot disc is a piece of 3 quarter inch thick Russian birch plywood, 18 inches in diameter. I pre-drilled holes for all assembly steps off camera so I can start by driving and setting quarter 20 T-nuts into four of those strategically placed holes with a plastic faced mallet. Next, I attach two heavy duty cast aluminum Lazy Susan bearings to the disc. The smaller bearing is 12 inches in diameter and the larger one measures 18 inches in diameter. I use three number 1224 by one and a half inch flathead screws to attach the inner ring of both bearings to the plywood plate by driving them through pre-drilled holes in both bearing and plywood plate. The screws hold tight in the plywood even though they're not actually threaded for that purpose. Once the screws are driven, you can see how the outer ring spins freely from the plywood plate. Now I flip the plate over and add flat washers and nylock nuts to each screw for maximum fail-safe strength. Combining two cast aluminum bearings is a huge improvement over the single stamped steel one I used originally. With that done, the next step is to assemble the upper pivot block. I sequentially stack pivot block plates and spacers on quarter 20 hex bolts using colored sharpie alignment triangles so all the pieces parts go back together in their original sequence to maintain alignment accuracy of the assembly. There's plenty of room for compounded error to creep in on a component like this, but by using the templating techniques and sequence shown for fabrication of other parts of the arm, creating a functional component like this is totally doable. After stacking parts, I use flat washers and nylock nuts to hold the whole Dagwood burger together. Notice the small orange circle around one of the holes. 
I use it as a reference mark and line it up with a similar mark on the face of the plywood pivot plate. Now I can drive stainless steel quarter 20 hex head cap screws with flat washers through holes in outer spacer blocks down through the pivot plate and into the T-nuts driven into the plate earlier. This makes for a very strong and highly elegant connection for these two key, dare I say pivotal, components. I spoke of that torsion bar of aluminum bar stock in the upper arm section while doing the boom arm overview early in the video. I had to lean on John Howard, a friend with amazing talent and capabilities, to help fabricate that specialty component. I designed and planned the torsion bar and cut one inch by half inch aluminum bar stock to size here in my shop, then took the parts over to John's dream shop where he set it up on a slick welding table to TIG weld the pieces together. A job like this is a daunting challenge to a guy like me, but it's child's play to a guy like John, who spent decades of his life building race cars and hot rods that are amazing in their own right. After routine but very accurate and impressive setup, he triggered the TIG and melded the pieces together in a light show of blinding high voltage arc light. In another life, I'd love to develop John's level of skill in the art of metalwork, machining, and TIG welding, but since that's not going to happen, I enjoy the process vicariously as he works. What you get to enjoy is seeing the finished torsion bar as it becomes an integral part of the upper boom arm. Final assembly of all the boom arm sections is similar to what you'll see here. I slip hex bolts with washers into holes in outer arm layers located with respective templates and pre-drilled before finishing. Then the layer is flipped over so I can stack spacers and layers together. The upper arm has spacers between the outer layers and the torsion bar doubles as a spacer for the center layers. Attentive viewers will understand that the torsion bar is symmetrical respective to the long axis, but has a subtle but defined top and bottom end. Because the arm section is tapered, holes drilled through end tabs of the torsion bar are spaced slightly differently on one end than the other, so I have to pay attention to that difference during assembly. Once all the layers and spacers are stacked up, I add flat washers and nylock nuts to all five bolts and snug them down with a quick spin of an impact driver to complete the assembly of this key component. With all the components of the arm and gantry complete, I can finally segue to installation. I'm shooting this clip with the camera mounted on the arm to show off the positioning versatility of this setup. What do you think? All I'll say is that this camera angle isn't even a challenge using the arm and gantry, but wouldn't even be possible with any tripod I've ever seen. The mounting board and gantry track installation sequences that you're about to see are somewhat choppy time-lapse video that I stitched together from a couple thousand still images I shot over the two hours or so that it took to lay out and attach those two 2x4 two plates and then attach the steel gantry track to those mounting boards. Since I was working alone, I set up a peri scaffold, 8-foot ladder, and a 12-foot scaffolding plank to have full access to the whole 20-foot length of the track at the same time. After making careful measurements to locate the track in the center of the shop, I snapped a couple of lines for edges of the mounting boards. Then I hired a 1x6 to hold one end of the first 22 foot long board and used a third hand pole to hold the middle of the floppy tuber for while I worked it into position. Once the board was in position, I drove a 2 and 3 quarter inch long number 9 Torx drive construction screw through a pre-drilled and countersunk hole to hold one end of the board in place. That allowed me to reposition the third hand pole and continue to drive screws into trusses to hold the board securely on the line. Installing the other board was then just a matter of repositioning my scaffold setup and asking my 1x6 helper to move over so I could repeat the steps to complete the job. Safely installing these 22 foot long boards on the 11 foot high ceiling in my shop while working alone demonstrates what's possible with a bit of strategic planning and the right setup. My brain tends to go into flow mode on jobs like this, so I lose track of time. But after about an hour, I'm completely satisfied with an uneventful and successful installation. Installing the welded steel gantry track on the 2 or 4 mounting boards was the same thing, only different. I have to detract in the position over the scaffolding and use nylon straps with hooks to begin lifting it into place. Then I use the specially notched 2x4 as a cross arm on a third hand clamp to jack the track the rest of the way up into position. Once the track was up tight to the mounting boards, I used a double square to center the track on the boards and drove flathead Torx drive screws through pre drilled holes in the cross tubes to hold it securely into place. With screws in the first two cross tubes, I was able to remove the third hand jack and reconfigure my scaffold setup 
so I could roll the Perry scaffold section into position for driving the rest of the screws. Working solo on a job like this means a lot of extra trips up and down the ladder, but again, shows what's possible with a little grit and determination. I even slow down for a quick stress test exercise of the track by suspending my full body weight from the track in a quick gymnastic L seat position before I finish driving the remaining screws from the track into the mounting boards. Well, there it is. Those last four Torx lags for holding uh, the track to the ceiling. And I had to switch fasteners because the roof trusses switch from going this direction here to one single truss going this direction here. So everything is just as solid as can be. And now, at long last, it's time to put the upper pivot onto the gantry plate and put the gantry plate assembly onto the track. Oh yeah. If you recall, this is what the gantry plate looks like. This is the top side. And you can see these uh, safety keeper blocks here and how the gantry plate will roll along the pipe like that. And should any of these pulleys fail, then this keeper block is there to keep the arm from crashing to the ground and or on my head. Like I said, this is the top side of the plate. This is the underside where the upper pivot will mount. You can see there's uh, holes here. Those are drilled and tapped for bolting this on. Uh, this is the assembly from earlier in the video with the pivot block mounted to the plywood plate. And these are the screws that hold the 18 inch and the 12 inch lazy Susan bearings on there. And there's three holes in each of these rings that line up with holes in this plate. And I've got access holes here, one for the outer lazy Susan ring and one for the inner lazy Susan ring. And I'm starting with this one over here on the outer ring. And I got myself in a bind by using number 1224 threaded screws. That's kind of an oddball size. And that's kind of been a pain to deal with. But that's the way it is. So I just pivot this around till I can see the outer ring and line up the hole in the plate. And now I've got to line up holes on the inner plate, which is easy enough. Start with that one right there. And that's what that looks like. Because I'm not a machine shop, I tighten the screws just loosely until all the screws are started and then go around and impact them down until they're nice and tight. And that completes this assembly so it's ready for installation on the track. The shop is still in disarray from fabrication and installation of the gantry track and repainting the shop, but everything's in place so that I can install the gantry plate on the track as long as I don't clock myself on the garage door opener on the way by so that installing this plate is simply a matter of Clipping the rollers onto the pipes and giving it a shove to put it in place. Just like that. This all pivots on here. This moves easily but not loosely, which makes it ready for the installation of the gantry arm itself. Well, shots like this are precisely why I went to the work of making this camera boom arm in the first place. This would be a lot easier to set up with a, a camera on an articulated arm rather than a tripod sitting on a table saw. But uh, with all these parts put together and the lacquer nice and dry, I can slide this guy together 
and get the bolt hole to line up in here. And just get that half inch bolt to thread through there. There's extra tension on the joint already because these two bolts are tight. So I might have to loosen something up just to get this to move and articulate it like I want, which I think is the case. But as it is, I can get nice movement on that arm and everything still slides back and forth when I take the clamp off of there. Everything's just like it needs to be. It's all pivots around, raises up and down with a decent amount of resistance, but the, um, the strength of the bearing and the gantry plate are strong enough that this doesn't stress that bearing. This whole pivots 360 degrees there. And once I I'll go over there and shut the camera off. I'll loosen these two bolts a little bit so that that movement is a little a little more smooth than it is right now. But that's how that section of the camera boom arm is installed. That's better already. And uh, these are all nylock nuts, so they're going to stay on there. They're not going to vibrate loose over time. But as the joint gets worn in, um, if it loosens up, I can always add a little more tension on those bolts and get the, uh, the amount of resistance in that joint that I want for positioning the boom arm wherever I need it to be for the camera position and the shot that I'm trying to get. As long as I have the scaffold set up, I'll just use it to install the next section of the arm here. And it's nice that there's enough friction to hold it there even without a bolt. Granted, there's no camera on the end, but it doesn't matter if that hole's lined up, so. And that's working just like it should so that when I get a washer, I can snug this up and get just the right amount of resistance. And as the leverage increases on the arm, I need to tighten the bolts, adjust them a little bit for the right amount of resistance to make that work. But as it is, that's a pretty effective setup for what needs to happen here. And I think that is going to be marvelous. And as you can see, this just keeps getting easier. And then I can install this lowest arm section standing on the floor, which is kind of nice. Now I've got to do some adjusting on the lengths of these bolts. Uh, they're a little too short for nylock nuts to work. Got to get bolts that are just a little bit longer with a little more thread so that nylock action uh, comes into play. But it takes less and less friction to hold these segments as I get down to the end of the arm here. So it'll take some adjustments, some getting used to, to figure out how much tension to put on which one of the segments to get the job done but it's pretty close to functional right now. And I'm pretty excited about that. And this is what the assembly for the business end of the camera boom arm looks like. I've got the mounting plate here. I just made a plastic buffer washer there for this little Ulanzi camera mount rotating swiveling camera mount. Just made these T-nuts here, T-handles, so that I can put these things together and adjust them as necessary. And of course this has its own built-in adjustment for, uh, for 360 degree swiveling plus rotating. So that's pretty sweet for camera positioning. 
this piece mounts to the bottom of the mesquite handle with another 3 8 16 uh, T handle here. So this joint articulates nice and easy. And then I've got this part here, another T nut with a metal insert there. And that holds this in place. And as you can see, that series of uh, T-nuts and joints makes articulation of this whole segment of the camera arm quick, smooth, and easy for accurate positioning of the camera no matter what orientation I want it to be in, which is a pretty sweet deal. And last but not least, I can attach the final section on here in much the same manner as all the other sections. And everything works just about like it's supposed to. I've got to increase the tension up there a little bit. But it doesn't take much at all to get the resistance I need on these joints. For positioning the camera just about any way that's necessary. And I'm inclined to say that that is going to work quite nicely. When it's all said and done. Sweet. Producing this video for you guys took almost two months longer than anticipated. So my new year, new gear message here seems a little out of place, but that's what happens when life happens, right? And even if you never build a camera boom arm and gantry for yourself, I do hope you find the time spent watching this video worth your while. As for me, I'm glad that the arm is done and ready for use. So I'll say as always, and until next time, thanks for watching. All right, Mr. Packet Arm, are you ready to get to work? Great. Let's start off by taking a walk this way to say goodbye to Frodo Man, my old faithful man Frodo tripod. Just think of it, over 34 million viewers have watched videos here on the channel over the 10 years we've worked together. And that's something to be proud of. So even though you'll be retiring and you'll be out of the limelight, you may be gone, but you won't be forgotten. Goodbye, old friend.